Okay, so now I'm going to discuss the big picture. Before I'm going to zoom into the specific disconnection syndromes, which has come a long way and has formed the framework that evolved to encompass the entire spectrum of higher functioning disorders. So I can refer to as higher functioning being as the primary dichotomy of cortical organization. So let's start with the most obvious ones. Naturally, I'm not referring to this typically described to contemporary pop psychology, where we have creativity on the one side and rational thinking on the other. So first I'm going to look at the broad picture that governs higher functioning. And here what we get is we get we're going to divide the brain into its subsequent subparts. So the first division that we're going to make is to divide the brain into its subsequent left and right hemisphere. So left being predominant in this for the remainder of this pre presentation, remember, right-handed people have a left side predominant hemisphere. And therefore, you're going to get these type of pathology or higher functioning associated with the left hemisphere. And then obviously the non-dominant would be the right hemisphere. This is not true for everybody, but for this presentation, I'm going to refer, to, when I refer to the dominant side, it's going to automatically, automatically point to the left hemisphere. And when I speak about the left hemisphere, I'm going to refer to the dominant side. Okay, so what we see here is the left hemisphere governs language, uh, governs the main function of the left hemisphere is language, as well as praxis, which is learned motor behavior. So <clears throat> a disorder in the left hemisphere will cause an aphasia, which is a disorder of language, and you'll get apraxia, which is, which is a disorder of learned motor behavior. Then we can go to the right hemisphere, which is the non-dominant hemisphere. The, the disorders that we typically see that's associated with the right hemisphere will govern disorders in prosody. In other words, this prosody is the musical intuition that we see. So these people with a, with a disorder in the right hemisphere will develop a prosody. Therefore, they will lose their musical intuition. And then we also get disorders that governs spatial representation. Therefore, the right hemisphere, the non-dominant hemisphere, predominantly plays a role in forming the agnosias. And then we also have attention. So attention is predominantly a frontal lobe the, the function functioning, but it's predominantly the right frontal lobe that governs more attentive abilities. And therefore, a person on, with a lesion on the right hemisphere might have a disorder in attention. And therefore, it might seem that these people are, uh, are, are confused. But in matter of fact, they're not confused. They just have a disorder in attention. So that basically sums up the differences between the left and the right hemisphere. So still staying with the broad picture, we're now going to divide the brain into its subsequent anterior and posterior segments. So the central sulcus would be the division for that. So staying, so going anterior to the to the central sulcus, we have motor or action. In other words, that's the output functioning of the brain occurs anterior to the central sulcus. So remember, output in the front. And this is really true for the whole neural axis. If you think about the brainstem, which, we, which we're going to discuss, as well as the spinal cord, there's always output in the front and then also input in the back. So again, posterior to the central sulcus, we have input functioning, and that will be perception. So sensation and perception are all functioning that comes in from the back. So this is true for most of the higher functions that we're going to talk about as well. So in other words, spatial attention for language, for prosodic content and skilled move movements. You always have to think of output in the front or action in the front and input in the back. So that's when we divide the brain into its subsequent anterior and posterior halves. Therefore, the frontal, in other words, the primary motor as well as supplementary motor areas, as well as the prefrontal motor areas, will predominantly play a major role with action or output functioning. And then posterior to the central sulcus, we have the parietal lobe with their subsequent two lobules. And this predominantly plays a role in input or perception. So anything posterior to the central sulcus, the parietal lobe, the occipital lobes, and even part of the temporal lobes play a have a major functioning in input. So still staying with a broad picture, 
we can now divide the brain into its dorsal and ventral slits. So if you remember, we initially said you first divide the brain into its left and right hemisphere. And then we're going to go anterior and posterior. And now we go dorsal to ventral. So basically what this represents, remember I said posterior to the central sulcus, we have input or perception. So now when, once we go to the dorsal pathway, we're going to think of the that forms the where pathway. And if we think of the ventral pathway, we're going to think of the what pathway. So the relevance of this means that if you think of a dorsal pathway, it's going to help you to locate yourself in, into the where environment, where you are currently in the environment. So it's perception that specifically deals with where. And then going ventrally, it's going to help you to localize in the what environment. So in other words, what you are looking at, what the environment represents to you. So if you've got lesions in these specific areas, you're going to dis have um, um, disorders that forms the that 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 is, that forms the basis of the wear pathway. In other words, you will get neglect. So if you go dorsally, you've got a lesion that sits dorsally, you're going to typically develop neglect. And if you've got a lesion that sits in, that's sitting ventrally, it's going to form the basis of the visual agnosias, the what what you're looking at. And again, to summarize, this is the primary dichotomies that you have to reason through when you have to try to localize on higher functioning and what higher functioning represents. So initially, we have, we have to first divide the brain into its subsequent left and right hemispheres. So that would be, left would be language and praxis, right would be prosody, spatial representation, in other words, the neglect, and also attention abilities. And then we're going to go anterior to posterior. So if you take the central sulcus anterior to that, it represents action or output functioning. And posterior to the central sulcus, it represents input or perception. And then once we've divided the brain up into those, into those four quadrants, we can now go dorsal or ventral. In other words, we're going to follow the where pathway and the what pathway and what they represent. So let's first look at what this dorsal to ventral pathway represents. And then we're going to go all the way through to the left and the right and subsequently discuss each of these higher functioning disorders. Okay, so now we're going to talk about how this visual processing or processing our input perceptive pathway follows when we, when we look at it. So we're first going to discuss the what pathway and then after the, looking at the what pathway, we're going to look at the dorsal or the where pathway. So the what or ventral pathway, where does it start? So the what pathway starts with the with our input sensation, the visual input pathway that we see and trying to look at what we see in the environment. So these are really crude sensory input um, um, sensation that we that we experience that typically follows that enters our our um, visual globes and then it goes via the the optic globes to the optic nerves, the chiasm, the tracks, the lateral genicular bodies and then obviously follows the optic radiation and then eventually gets to the cortex. So this is really the bottom up processing pathway, this pathway of crude sensory input that happens. And then eventually when we get to the cortex, um, we now ultimately begin an area what is referred to as the V1 of the cortex of higher functioning. And this is referred to as the top down area of processing or the higher functioning of the what pathway processing center. Okay, so this area called V1, which is a map of our visual world, this is the first cortical center of visual processing, where all our images of our vision sync and converge together with and become full of raw data, like lines and shapes and colors and etc. And it's here in the brain where it gets organized, and this is referred to as retinotopic organization. But the thing is, this is not the only map of our world that is back here. There's actually map after map after map and we can number these further down there is the v1 and then we get the v2 and then v3 and then v4 and so forth and then after v4 there's actually areas that, that we've that we discovered and we've been giving them letters and acronyms like lo and vo and um, etc etc so this pathway ultimately arrive at regions which are much less like map like but now it has a, this remarkable specificity for representing different kinds of visual information. Things like the appearance of faces, 
our mothers and fathers, husbands and wives. Yes, there's actual faceless that are being represented down here. So this, this is referred to as called the face space. And, and this has been long before the existence of, 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 of social media places like Facebook, etc. So as we can see, these visual areas are all focused on extracting information from this blooming, buzzing environment, um, uh, environment and visual input pathways that we're getting. So all of this confusing stuff is actually coming in from our vision, and then we try to try to make up and segment and figure out what these objects really are. And extracting, and extra, they're also we're trying to extract information from them in order to identify these things. So this is what the ventral occipital cortex are for. It's extracting this information. And then obviously damage to this area is going to cause the visual agnosias, which is the inability to recognize a visual stimulus despite intact functioning of lower level of vision, which will then form the main basis of the agnosia syndromes. So you can have a pretty perfect acuity on the Snellen chart, but you will still have trouble in trying to figure out what that E actually is, or what your brother John represents or not. Okay, so now let's look at what this V2 pathway, the this V1 and V pathway represents in our retinotopic organization uh, functioning. So if you've got a lesion sitting here at V1 or V2, we develop what we refer to as an aperceptive agnosia. So what is an aperceptive agnosia? So the way to remember this is that these people have the have difficulty in perceiving the environment. Remember that basic retinotopic organization. In other words, the lines and the intersecting polygons and, and, and colors and those type of things. So this is what that V2 pathway represents if you've got a lesion in here. So the quickest and easiest way to test this V1 and V2 pathway or center would be to ask the person to just copy these figures and if they you if a person's got a lesion sitting in here they will they won't be able to copy these figures they won't be able to copy the intersecting intersecting poly um, pentagons and they won't be able to copy these more complex figures um, also another thing that you can get is what we refer to as an uh, a, a color agnosia or an or an uh, agnosia that refers to as an ac achromatopic agnosia so what happens here is um, patients who are unable to identify the different types of colors, or although they can see it, they cannot identify the red for the red, but they can still see it. So if you give them an Ishihara color chart, they'll still be able to see the green two or the or the uh, or the um, 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 yellow 42, but they won't be able to see the color red and name it red and point to the color red. And that basically sums up this V1 and V2 pathway. So it forms the basis of getting of getting an aperceptive agnosia when, where you are unable to perceive the outer linings of objects, that basic retinotopic organization. So this is actually now going to become quite fun now. And this is where a lot of social media plays on, so on these centers that I'm referring to now. I will show you a lot of examples in between um, these areas that we're going to discuss and how how people make fun of it and, and play with it because it's really interesting. So this is going to be the first example that I was referring to just now. And this guy's going to govern or give you a demonstration of what that color agnosia typically represents. So I want you to just to focus for me on that dark spot in the middle of the screen. And while you look at it, I'm going to play this video. Don't look anywhere, just look at that dark spot. So it's going to wait 10 or 15 seconds before it switches over. And there we go. So while you're still focusing on the dark spot, you can actually see colors. There's blue sky, white clouds, green glass, and you actually see the, the sand color of this castle. But a matter of fact, there was never colors in from the beginning. It was just a gray picture. So it went from that orange yellow blue castle straight to grain this this gray picture 
there was no coloring in of the screen in between so there was no blue sky we didn't see grass etc and this is actually what that higher functioning area is it's an association it's the way that you think it should look like and therefore it looks like that and that is what the v1 and v2 pathway represent so if you've got a lesion in there it's exactly the opposite is going to happen to these people okay so that basically concludes what v1 and v2 should look like so these are the aperceptive areas the areas that perceive that basic input functioning now we're going to look at what v4 look looks like or what v4 represents and this forms the basis of our association areas so if you've got a lesion situated here in v4 you get what is called an associative agnosia so what is an associative agnosia so remember the v1 and v2 are intact in these patients if you've got a lesion situated here so in other words these patients are able to perceive the linings they don't have an a perceptive agnosia they can still perceive and copy these lines but then they're unable to make an association with them and therefore if you give them this figure this is referred to as the papa rotor figure so if you give them this figure they will be able to copy the lines and the make the drawings but they won't be able to tell you that they see or make an association of an umbrella a mug a pear or even a saw so they won't be able to tell you these the the, the associated details with it and therefore you can almost you can almost make an association between that these people can see the trees but they cannot make the trees for a forest and the same happens when you give them a navon figure and this is referred to as an asymmetric agnosia so the patients are, un, are able to pick up if you tell them if you give them this figure they're able to tell you all of the l's they can tell you that they see an l and l and an l and an l and so on and so forth but they are unable to make an association that these l's are actually forming an h that's the bigger picture so they're unable to tell you that the, these trees are making a forest same as with this picture that i've shown here and i've been representing here in the middle the whole time so you can see that it's actually just three pac-men like or representing figures there's no triangle in between your brain is creating this triangle to make an association that there should be a triangle situated between these three pac-men like figures and this is what the association area represents okay so still staying on this what pathway we're now even going to go a little bit deeper and now we're going to go to the visual fusiform area or the fusiform gyrus and this fusiform gyrus represents our area that's referred to as the face space okay so if you've got a lesion situated here in our face space you're going to develop something that is referred to as how as, as a prosomacognosia so a prosomacognosia means that you are unable to identify faces so a specific person so you can still see that that more lower down association areas are intact you can see that it's a this is a male a dark-skinned male above the age of 60 more or less he looks he's got a serious facial expression um, or he looks attentive but you're unable to make that association that this is our precedent or that this person represents our father or mother or brother but you're able to see that it's a friendly looking person and he's got blue eyes or dark hair but you're unable to know that that is actually my mother that i'm talking to this is a specific area in the in the in the in the in the in the temporal uh, temporal lobes that's referred to as the fusiform gyrus that represents our face space so this is really interesting this is just a picture of um, Giuseppe Archimboldo so he was during the dark ages he was a, a, a famous painter and what he did was during those times it was unethical or not allowed to paint faces of humans so what he did was he played on this area and he painted fruits and colors and then he made this he created these facial images from these paintings that he that he that he made so in other words this person's hat and then obviously the eyes and the beard and that would be the hair and that's the mouth and the nose and the cheeks so he made this because it wasn't allowed back in the dark ages to paint um, to paint the faces of human beings so he already discovered what this face area was long ago 
Right. So another another uh, demonstration of this would be that everybody knows that this is um, Adele that we have in this picture here. But did every, anybody notice that this was actually what Adele looked like uh, upside down? So again, we played on this face space area, and this is what um, um, and this is what your brain knew that what Adele was supposed to look like. But in matter of fact, it was actually um, a growth skew picture of her. This is what is referred to as the Thatcher illusion. <clears throat> because this is what this visual fusiform area was supposed to represent, that face. But in matter of fact, it was different. So this is almost what people will see when they develop a prosopagnosia. So they develop this growth skew pictures of people's faces. So what we do for these people that have lesions in here that develop this prosopagnosia is that we have to train them in order to make associations of the people with different things. So you'll tell these people to make an association with that specific tie or this jacket. And by just looking at that tie or jacket or even the hair of the person, that you'll be able to make an association and know, hey, that is our president that we see on this picture. Or, hey, that is my mother. Or that's my father. Or even my brother. So you have to tell them to make an association with different objects, even by their shoes. And that the faces won't be able to be, that you can't use the faces anymore. Okay, so that basically concludes the, the ventral pathway, the what pathway. So now we're going to move and shift gears and move to a different stream. And now we're going to go dorsally, the where pathway. And this is going to, the, the basis of the where pathway is going to be situated in the posterior parietal cortex, the PPC. And this forms the basis, if we've got a lesion in here, you get a visual spatial neglect. So what happens when you've got a lesion here in the PPC is that, like I said, like I said you get this visual spatial neglect. So what happens is these people are unable to pick up this visual representation on the one side of their body. Typically, it involves the left hemisphere. Because remember I said the non-dominant lobe, you've got your visual spatial representations. That was in the non-dominant hemisphere. So the non-dominant hemisphere typically plays a primary role in picking up both areas that represents our visual spatial areas, the three-dimensional areas around us. So in other words, if you've got a lesion in there, you typically lose, lose one visual sp spatial area on the one side. So if you ask them to draw a clock, they're unable to draw the one side of the clock. They won't be able to know that there even should be an existence of clock on that side. The same with a daisy or flower that you ask them to draw. Another way to do this is that you ask them to do the target cancellation test. So what you do here is you make a lot of lines on a piece of paper and then you ask a person to start crossing out those lines. So in a normal individual with a dominant parietal lobe situated on the left side, the non-dominant on the right side, remember this represents the visual spatial areas, you typically start crossing out on the top left hand corner of a page. But a person who's got a lesion in here won't be able to do that. And they start in the bottom right hand corner and they start cancelling out all these pieces of lines in order to get, um, in order to um, to try to, to catch all of them. But as you can see here, this individual struggled with that and they left out this left area. Right, so in order to understand this, we should know that basically both parietal lobes do have an overlap in functioning. So if you've got if you've got a lesion situated here in the dominant parietal lobe, what's going to happen is you're going to have maybe a little bit of visual spatial loss on the right hand side, but not really too much because the non-dominant parietal lobe plays the major role in this visual spatial representation areas. Remember, the dominant's got that more uh, represents more of language and praxis ability. So the non-dominant visual spatial. So if you've got a lesion situated in the dominant lobe you might get a little bit of, of, of visual spatial neglect, but not really too much because the non-dominant parietal lobe overtakes that function. But once you get a lesion situated in the non-dominant parietal lobe, what's going to happen is you're most likely going to develop neglect on the one side because now we're knocking out this visual spatial area. So other tests that we can do to test for this visual spatial neglect would be to represent two fingers onto both sides 
of this per person's visual spatial area. So when you just represent one finger into the one field, you'll be able to see it. When you represent again another finger in another field, you'll be able to see it. But when you do it at the same time, the person is going to have a visual spatial neglect on the left because they've got that loss of that visual spatial area representation on the one side of their body. Another test that we can do is called the line bisection method. So what we can do here is you can draw a line and you ask the person to make a stripe through the middle of the line. But with, with a, in a person who's got visual spatial neglect, they're able to see the middle and they'll make it, they'll cross it out. So this is a nice test to see, to see, to monitor how this person's neglect improves. So if you keep on asking them to make lines, you can see on a daily basis that people who's had a stroke on the one side of the brain, typically, like I said, that um, a non-dominant site had developed this visual spatial neglect and and how it recovers, you can monitor it with this line dissection method. And then another test we can do is called the East Chester clapping test. So the East Chester clapping test is a nice test to perform. So what you do here is you ask the person to clap their hands and a person who's got neglect, they will imaginary clap the hand. They won't, they won't even lift this hand to the side to, to clap them together. They'll just stop in the midline and then just proceed opening and closing their hands con consistently. And a person who's got weakness, just pure weakness, the person will know that they've got weakness in this hand and therefore they will try to manipulate this hand, put it on their tummy and then they'll try to clap it even though it's weak on the one side. And that's a person who just has weakness. But a person who's got visual spatial neglect will imaginarily stop in the midline and think that they're clapping with their opposite with their opposite arm as well. Okay, so let's look at other functions the PPC has. Remember, I said this is the central sulcus, and everything posterior to the central sulcus mediates input. So, input or perception. So now I'm going to talk about cortical sensation. So this cortical sensation is predominantly mapped out in this. Uh, posterior parietal cortex as well. So let's first start off with what, we refer, what is referred to as asteriognosis. So what happens in asteriognosis is that you have to give a person a, 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 um, a, a, a coin, a two rand or a five rand coin, but they're supposed to close their eyes. Remember the definition of an agnosia is a disorder in recognizing sensory stimuli despite having intact sensation. So it's, it's a, they, these people are supposed to recognize it despite having intact sensation. So you cannot test this on a person who's got a myelopathy or are paralyzed from the cervical spinal cord downwards. They won't be able to, 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 to identify this object because they cannot feel anything in their arms or, or in their legs. So you won't be able to test these patients. So a person where you're testing the cortical sensory pathway, this higher functioning form of sensation, you have to have intact sensation. So you have to ask the person to close their eyes, give them the object, and then they have to identify it. So if they're unable to identify this, we refer to it as being asteriognosis. So the second thing that we can do is graphesthesia. So with graphesthesia, what we're going to do is we're going to ask the person to close their eyes, and then you're going to make a drawing on in the, in the palms of their hands, a figure of four or an eight or a seven, then this person needs to correctly identify the figure that you're drawing inside their hands. Um, another, another clinical feature that we can look at is extinction phenomenon. So what we do here is we do touch localization. So we ask a person to close their eyes and then you quickly touch the person on both sides of their body. And then this person needs to be able to know that you've, picked, that you've touched them on the left as well as in the right, right side of their body. If they've got what we refer to as this extinction phenomenon, they won't be able to do this. So you'll touch them on both sides and they'll only pick up that you touch them on their right arm. And they won't be able to know that you touch, touch them on their left arm as well. And this is referred to as extinction phenomenon. And then lastly, we get something that's called two point discrimination. So there's specific areas where you're able to discriminate with two points. We, we can look at the lips and the palms as well as the wrists and then even on the back. So there's specific normal areas that we can take um, that's got specific normal values to it. So a person with 
with intact sensation that you touch them with two points at the same time and they're unable to identify or discriminate that you touch them with two or one point have this form that's referred to as two point loss of two point discrimination okay so just to give just to remind you of the bigger picture here we now specifically looked at uh, the akinosias or the visual spatial representation in our areas and we've discussed the dorsal and the ventral pathway the what and the where pathway so that concludes akinosias now next up we're going to move back take one step backwards again and now we're going to divide the brain into its respective left and right hemispheres now the first thing that we're going to look at would be disorders that governs language in other words the aphasias okay so what are the disorders of speech and language so we typically get the aphasias as well as the dysarthias the dysarthias i will discuss with you in one of the other lectures so let's look at aphasia so an aphasia is an acquired disorder of language comprehension and expression as opposed to a dysarthria which is a disorder of articulation and phonation so in this disorder the person will sound abnormal in this disorder the person will have a disorder of language in other words they will lose their ability to communicate via language okay so let's look at aphasias and how you would approach an aphasia so the first step in an aphasia is obviously to ensure that there's no communication barrier between you and the patient and then the second thing would be the to differentiate it from an acute confusional state so if that patient comes in um, with a subsequent delirium he might confuse it as it being an aphasia because the patient is going to be delirious so it's going to look like the patient is unable to communicate with you and you might wrongly diagnose this person as being in delirious state or an acute confusional state the management is obviously going to be profoundly different when looking at a patient who's got a delirium versus a person who's got an aphasia because one of the most common causes of an aphasia specifically when they represent to the casualty or emergency department would be a stroke so the management is completely different from managing a stroke versus managing a person who's in an acute confusional state okay so what are the first three steps that we have to perform so first we have to we have to ensure that the patient maintains etiquette in other words they will behave appropriately when you've got a, a person with an aphasia so they will behave appropriately they will maintain eye contact with you they won't interfere with you while you talk to them although they won't be able to understand it so let's say a person's got an, a, a certain type of aphasia something like a vernicus aphasia so they won't be able to communicate with you but and comprehension can be lost but they will still maintain etiquette they won't they will be appropriate for the circ circumstances that they present in they won't have abnormal behavior and then the third thing that we can do is patients with aphasia will maintain penmanship so if you give a person with an aphasia a pen they will know it's a pen even though they might not be able to communicate by right written language or they might be well, might not be able to to use that pen writing might might be lost that's referred to as an agraphia so they won't be able to write but they will still know it's a pen and they have to write with it they will hold it the way they should hold a pen but a person with a delirium won't have that and that pen will immediately turn into a weapon of mass destruction that's just a joke but typically um, these people the pen will be flung into the emergency into the emergency department or um, it, it but it won't be used as a pen okay so once now that we've established that this person has got an aphasia let's look at the different types of aphasias that we get so we namely get a Broca's aphasia a Wernicke's aphasia a global aphasia a conductive aphasia transcortical motor and transcortical sensory aphasia as well as an anomic aphasia so as we can see there are seven different types of aphasias that we're going to talk about all right so how do we differentiate between these aphasias these seven different types of aphasias they should surely have their clinical differentiating features and this is where the tests come in so there are six tests or six steps that we can perform in order to differentiate all these aphasias from each other and that would be namely looking at fluency comprehension whether there's the ability to repeat sentences whether reading writing and naming objects are intact
So let's start off with fluency. How would you test fluency in a person? So there are basically two steps that we can do. So you can ask the person open-ended questions. So remember not to fall into the trap to ask the person, how are you, how are you doing today? Because then they're going to answer in simple one-worded answers. So I'm doing well, good, bad, ill. So these are one-worded closed-ended questions. So you have to ask them open-ended questions, like what brought you to the hospital? Um, these are better questions that you can ask. And then you can also use simple aids. So this is called the cookie jar picture. So this is in part of the stroke pathway. So what you can do is you can show a person this picture and you have to tell the person to tell you a story of what is happening in this picture. And, and then they should obviously tell you that there's a, a woman that's washing the dishes and kids are stealing some cookies from a jar and the, the one is slipping and falling from this jar while the woman is washing and she's not really paying attention. She's thinking of something different and the water is spilling from the, from the basin. So these are typically what you can ask these people to do when you ask them to interpret the cookie jar picture. So then you're assessing their fluency, the number of words they are producing. So once you've established their fluency, you've asked, you asked them open-ended questions or you've given them the picture to represent or to interpret, there are a couple of things that you can look at. And then the two disorders that we're going to see is either you can be fluent, you can have an aphasia that's fluent, in other words, something like a vernicus aphasia, or you can have a non-fluent aphasia. That would be an expressive or a broccus aphasia. So let's look into this now. So affluent aphasia, and these patients typically produce more than 100 words per minute. In a non-fluent aphasia, you produce one less than 50 words per minute. So that more or less equates to a phrase length of 5.8 words per phrase or 1.2 words per phrase. So you can see here, this is literally every second, you're only producing one word at a time. So your sentence structures are not just one word, you're producing one word at a time per second. So this is really, you can see, slow. This is really, a person is really slow when they produce this, when they've got a non-fluent aphasia. So patients with a fluent aphasia might typically have absent agrammatism, while a person with a non-fluent aphasia use telegraphic agrammatism. The content in a patient with, that is fluent is typically empty and they've got paraphasic content. With a non-fluent aphasia, it still has a high content content. So what happens here is with a paraphasia, what we're referring to here is these people with a fluent aphasia can have what is referred to as, as semantic paraphasias. So with a semantic paraphasia, you still you, you're going to still use a lot of words, but you're going to forget what that meaning of that word is or represents. In other words, you're going to lose uh, the word table and you're going to still know it's a thing, an object, and you're going to call it an it or an object, but you won't call it a table and a chair. So you're going to say something like, well, I'm sitting on it and I'm eating from it, but uh, the object is, is it. So... You can see here, so you're losing that bigger quality of words and you're just using more, more primitive pronouns instead of the word itself. And a person that has got a non-fluent aphasia, what happens here is they've got literal paraphasias. So what's going to happen here is the person is going to, is going to give another term that really sounds similar to the original one. So for instance, they will say, I'm going to put on my house. And then there will be a brief pause because they know they said something that's incorrect. And then they're going to think about it, maybe even become a little bit frustrated because they know they didn't want to say, I'm going to put on my house. They wanted to say, I'm going to put on my blouse. And that is what a literal paraphasia sounds like. Um, yeah, so that's basically the main differences between a fluent and a non-fluent aphasia. Okay, so let's look at comprehension. So comprehension is being tested when you ask them to perform one to three step commandments. So a very important note to, to something to take note of is that you should not give these people any nonverbal cues, cues. So you're not going to point to the hand and say, listen, put, pick up your hand. 
You're not going to do that. You have to look them straight in the eyes and then you give them the commandment to close your eyes. Pick up your hand. With your hand, close your eyes, pick up your hand and with your hand, touch your ear. So these are the simple commandments that you can give these patients. But it's very important not to give those non-verbal cues when you are testing the comprehension part of an aphasia. So the next step would be to test repeating. So when you test repeating, you're going to ask the person to repeat a simple sentence, something like no ands, ifs, or buts. Um, you're going to test the auditory verbal pathway while you're asking the person to repeat the sentence. And um, if they are able to do so successfully, then you know that the pathway is still intact. So this pathway is represented in a simplified form. It's called the Wernicke Lichtheim model of aphasias. So you're going to ask them to repeat this utterance. It's going to enter peripherally. So this would be the peripheral auditory input center, the peripheral nerve. It's going to transverse up into the brainstem, get to the auditory cortex. From there, it's going to jump over to Wernicke's area. And from Wernicke's area, we're going to transverse via the arcuate fasciculus to the more anterior Broca's area. Remember, I'm, I mentioned output in the front foot, output in the front and input in the back. So this is a similar concept. So output in the front, so this would be more or less the central sulcus. So output in the front, input in the back. So then Broca's area will affect the output or expressive center. And then from there, it's going to go back towards brain, the brainstem mediating peripheral speech production. So if you've got a lesion situated here, most likely on both sides, you're going to have a, develop a disorder, what's referred to as a dysarthria. But if you have a lesion in any of these specific areas, you're going to do you're going to develop an anaphasia. So just next to Broca's area, we have the transcortical fields. So these are the concept fields that we get. And next to the Wernicke's area, we've got the transcortical, also again the transcortical fields. And um, so as I mentioned, central sulcus in the in the center, so output in the back, so motor and motor in the front. So this would be the transcortical motor area. And this would represent the transcortical sensory area because this is posterior to the central sulcus and this is anterior to the central sulcus. So auditory information first arrives bilaterally within the auditory cortex through an enthralling pathway known as the auditory pathway. Um, so that extends from the peripheral cochlea up into the brainstem and it eventually terminates centrally on the auditory on the auditory cortex. Um, so this so this auditory cortex has bilateral um, representations of information from each ear, and that information is encoded within this primary auditory cortex. It's also known as Herschel's gyrus. So just a little interesting feature about this primary auditory cortex is that it is tonotopically organized. So there's actually a map layered across this cortical surface with representation of the different frequencies of sound from low frequencies to high frequencies. So that is for the tonotopical um, cortex with bilateral representation from each ear. Therefore, you have to get bilateral lesions of the primary auditory cortex to develop pure cortical deafness. Okay, so this frequency of content of sounds now need to be interpreted into symbolic meaning. This takes place in the back here, in what is known as Wernicke's area, which roughly lies at the temporoparietal junction, close to the domain of the angular, eye, um, angular gyrus. And this is the spot where written information, auditory information, as well as symbolic communication gets linked up. With, uh, so this gets linked up with meaning, in other words, that semantic content that I referred to earlier. So this is the localization where you would understand an utterance that has been repeated to you. Then ultimately, you'll need to formulate your reply or the desire to repeat that utterance um, back to the person that spoke it initially. So now it's time for actions to take place. So again, you'll need to get from posterior to anterior, right along the arcuate fasciculus to the place found for language output production. Remember, this is now anterior to the central sulcus. So that's output or motor functioning that's taking place here. And this area is situated left to the inferior frontal gyrus. So one interesting feature of this spatial localization of the Broca's area is that you see 
It's right down here, nestled in the left inferior frontal lobe. And it's right adjacent to the motor strip, which is making its way down to the bottom, just next to Broca's area. And what is located here is the homuncular representation of the face, the tongue, the larynx, and as well as the pharynx, which is just adjacent to this articular output production center or Broca's area. And this is why where the muscles of articulation sits. So this is also why some people who commonly have a cortical lesion, which produces a language impairment, have accompanying facial weakness. Okay, so if we start lesioning the different components, we can get the core components of the classical perisylvian aphasias. These are the aphasia centers that are situated next to the sylvian fissure, the perisylvian aphasias. And for each of these, we characterize the nature of the aphasia in terms of what the patient cannot do. So in other words, can they produce fluent speech or not? Can they comprehend instructions given to them? And are they able to repeat a sentence? And damage to each of these different components give you the combination of deficits you would see with the perisylvian aphasias. So now we can move beyond the so-called perisylvian aphasias and into those that are the so-called the transcortical aphasias represented by these red spots. So this occurs from damage to the cortical areas just adjacent to the core of Broca's or Wernicke's language regions and thus immediately spare this immediate perisylvian cortex. And lesions here produce the so-called transcortical aphasias. So one thing that I can, they all have in common is that they have the, proper, pro, the property of sparing repetition. So the mark of a transcortical aphasia is that the repetition pathway is intact. So the core circuit of hearing and utterance and then repeating it back to the examiner is intact. So again, repetition is intact, but the higher level of comprehension or production are impaired. So as we can see here, we ask the person to repeat a sentence, like no ands, ifs, or buts. It entered into the auditory cortex, or crossed over to, to the vernicus area, was mediated to the frontal area via the arcuate fasciculus. Broca's area, um, start, they start with uh, language production in, in, in Broca's area, then which mediated this, that speech that speech center, that repetition center, that repeat, repetition um, sentence, it's now going to repeat back into the brainstem, mediating speech production. So by asking a person to repeat a sentence, we are bypassing these transcortical areas. Okay, so remember, we're still testing the modalities of aphasia. We're now going to reading and writing. We covered now fluency, um, comprehension, as well as naming objects and um, of course we did repetition as well so now we still have reading and writing that's um, that still needs to be explained okay so again remember while we're discussing reading and writing we have to think of output in other words writing occurs in the front and reading which would be an input function occurs in the back here so language and spoken language is, of course, just one element of symbolic communication. And then one important thing about the aphasias is that it's not only spoken impairment, but, of course, there's a domain of general impairment in language, symbolic impairment and communication impairment. So if somebody speaks sign language, they will have difficulty in communicating in specific sign language, the same way as a person that has difficulty in communicating spoken word. So therefore, the same can occur with writing, but there are th though additional syndromes that have, that have left hemisphere focused, in which there are more specific deficits associated with reading and writing. So alexia, or the inability to read, remember, I said input in the back, so it's predominantly a syndrome that affects the posterior part behind the central sulcus. So alexia without agraphia is one of these syndromes and it's probably the best example of this so-called disconnecting syndromes, otherwise known as pure word blindness. So in other words, the one area of the cortex has been almost disconnected from the other area. So this idea that you have an area of cortex that has been deprived of input and then you have an impairment of cognition that follows. So in alexia without agraphia, there's an impairment in word reading, 
but still intact writing. So when confronting a patient with this, you have to make the patient write something down on a piece of paper, which they are perfectly able to do. And then you take it away from them. A few minutes later, you bring it back to them and ask them to read the thing that they've written. In these cases, they're unable to do so. So they can write, but they cannot read. So this is classically understood as a disconnecting of the left hemisphere language regions from intact, uh, from intact visual input coming in from the right hemisphere. So the demonstration that a small axial picture of the brain, that if you have a lesion that damages the left occipital lobe, thus resulting in a right-sided homonymous hemianopsia, which I will show you later when we look at afferent neuroophthalmology, you will have an intact right occipital lobe and therefore an intact left visual field. The trouble is that written information that appears on this intact left visual field is unable to get over to the left side where it's supposed to be processed into symbolic meaning. So it typically is associated with damage, not only to the occipital lobe but on the left, but also to the forceps major of the corpus callosum. Another disorder where reading and writing plays a key feature is Gutzman syndrome. So with Gutzman syndrome, you typically have a graphia where you have the trouble in writing, often associated with a component of alexia as well. So remember, we're now moving a little bit more to the front here. Because remember I said, there's output in the front. So now we can see here, we're transversing more from the posterior aspect, a little bit more to the anterior side. And this is where we now develop a syndrome called the Gertzman syndrome. So the core components of a graphia and a calculi, which is a trouble of basic arithmetic, as well as finger agnosia, which is the inability to come up with the names of the different fingers. And then patients will also experience right to left confusion. So this kind of seems like a bizarre constellation of symptoms that is associated with Gertzman syndrome. But the way to understand Gertzman syndrome is that in the parietal lobe, there's a representation and integration of different modalities of information, which are brought into registry. And one thing that shapes a lot of this representation fields within this left parietal lobe is information about the right hand. So for instance, when you learn how to count, so remember that is counting from one to five, we use our fingers to count, which then forms the basis of our new numeric system. So counting, for instance, is intimately tied with our hands and fingers, and the names of the fingers are wrapped up tightly with a set of ideas governing them. And being able to tell the left from right is handedness. There's something, if something wrong occurs, about being able to recognize the mirror symmetry of our hands and being able to use that as the basis of telling from left to right, you get a confusion between the two sides. So as we can see, these are all elementary functions of writing as well, which is really tied in with this co coordination and knowledge of our hands. So you can think of Gertzman syndrome as a damage to a bunch of elementary cognitive functions that are, a that are built upon a scaffolding of knowledge of our hands. So now we strayed a little bit from our path of aphasias while we were, looked, well, while we were looking at um, reading and writing. So let's... So no, this then allows, so together with the reading and writing, fluency comprehension, and as well as repetition and naming objects, it allows us to fill out the rest of this table with a transcortical motor aphasia, which is an expressive aphasia that has an intact repetition, and transcortical sensory aphasia, where you have impaired in comprehension and fluency, yet you have intact repetition. So remember, transcortical aphasia occurs due to adjacent lesions that spare repetition, where the perisylvian aphasias, you get that repetition pathway that is affected. And then you can think of reading and writing, where writing would be an output function. Therefore, persons with a Broca's aphasia will lose their ability to write. But a person who's got an, uh, a receptive aphasia, in other words, a vernicus aphasia, will still be able to write. But because it's situated very posteriorly, they will, be, they will lose their function to read. Okay, so looking at the key features of each of the aphasias, we can get Broca's aphasia, in which patients have effortful speech with disorganized grammar and literal paraphasic errors. Like I mentioned, these are erroneous words, which are substituted with other words that sound alike. 
for instance, that house blouse example. With the vernicus aphasia, we get a fluent speech that has empty content. They usually present with new logisms. In other words, they coin new words, and they also have semantic paraphasias, where the meaning of the word is substituted. Like for instance, chair for table, it for uh, it for table, or a thing. Um, yes. So, in other words, this combination of paraphrases and neologisms can create the entity that creates something that's referred to as a word salad. Okay, so in conduction aphasia, usually you have poor repetition for sentences. They show hesitancy and they decrease in all three short-term memory. Interestingly, some people with a transcortical motor aphasia have some form or some components of ecolalia. So they just repeat back to you what you are saying. In other words, when they, they will just keep on repeating the things that you're saying without attributing it to any other meaning to it. And that basically con concludes the aphasia descriptions. Okay, so just to remind you again about the big picture, we initially went from dorsal to ventral. We covered the what and the where pathway. We looked at the anterior and posterior pathway where we discussed action and perception. And now we're going to look at the left and right hemisphere where we discuss the, the language disorders that it governs language. And now we're going to look at disorders that governs learned motor behaviors, otherwise known as apraxia. Okay, so the definition of an apraxia states that it's an acquired disorder of learned or skilled mood movements in the presence of having intact strength and sensation. So you cannot test for an apraxia patient in other words, if they've got weakness, ataxia, sensory deficits, or the inability to comprehend, you will be unable to test for an apraxia. So there are five forms of apraxia. They are namely ideomotor apraxia, dissociative and ideational apraxia, conceptional and limb kinetic apraxia. So this falls beyond the scope of this presentation, but I'm going to briefly tell you what apraxia is about. And I'll quickly look at ideomotor and ideational apraxia, which are the two most common forms of apraxia. Okay, so still sticking with the left hemisphere and keeping in mind that skilled actions we can do with our hands, we can, we can come to ideomotor apraxia. So apraxia is technically an acquired deficit of learned or skilled motor movements, which occurs in the presence of having intact strength and sensation. Not that the hand is weak or that it's numb or that there's any cerebellar dysfunction, it is that it has a, a problem executing some complex multi-step functions, which involves the hand. And the key thing to know is that in most of these cases of apraxia, even when the left hand is clumsy together with that right hand, it is that it's a result of a left hemisphere hemispheric lesion. And I'll explain this clumsiness shortly. So generally, the way that you would test an apraxia is that you have to ask a patient to pantomimine or interpret skilled movements movements or gestures so you can ask the patient to demonstrate the, the, the way that they would swing a hammer to hit a nail so what you would hope to see is that the patient have some movement around the wrist and elbow to accomplish this task or you can ask somebody to show you how to use a saw to saw a through a board or the ability ability to put to put butter on a toast or to demonstrate to you how you would comb your hair. So these are typical motions that you could test for when you want to test for an apraxia. You're not going to give them the tool to use it with. They have to pantomime and show you how they would use the tool, even if you don't give them the tool. You can also ask the patient to interpret your motion. For instance, you might ask the patient to identify what action you are engaging in. So you can ask the patient to interpret your cop and, cop and copy you as well. So you can get apraxia in focal lesions, particularly when they involve the dominant hemisphere. So therefore, this is quite common, a common, com, uh, quite a common cognitive impairment seen with some of the neurodegenerative disorders like cortical basal ganglionic degeneration syndrome, because there's a lot of pathology located within these parietal lobes, producing apraxia early on, early on, and the disease cause. Okay, so let's talk about the anatomy of 
praxis and what happens when you do develop an apraxia. So within the left inferior parietal lobe, there's an abstract representation of skilled movements and knowledge in how to act upon the environment. For instance, what makes a good tool a good tool? The fact that a hammer has to be hard on one end in order to bound onto something. Even though a banana, you can grasp like a handle, um, like a handle of a hammer, it wouldn't still, it wouldn't be very good for nailing in a nail. Except obviously, if you've got a higher fo a form of functioning and you freeze it like this guy is doing in this picture. So all of the abstract knowledge is encoded within this left parietal lobe. But again, you have to take that abstract knowledge and then turn it into action. So by carrying on with this scheme that I've presented in the beginning of the of the um, represent of this pres presentation, we get perception in the back and action in the front. So that abstract representation has to be turned into action, which is then situated in the premotor cortex. So the premotor cortex then provides command to the contralateral limb in order to execute that skilled action. And of course, notably, if you want your left hand to do some skilled action, that information needs to cross the corpus callosum to get over to that right premotor cortex in order to instruct the left hand to perform the action. So that then allows us to think about what the consequences are when you have lesions in the system. So I'll start in the reverse number of order. So I'll start with number three. So if you have a lesion in the inferior parietal lobule, in other words, if you damage the core representation in the knowledge of praxis, you're going to have apraxia in both limbs. So you will be unable to discriminate or identify movements of others. So you'll have a, a total knockout of the praxis ability. So this is the core representation of the praxis ability is situated here in this parietal lobe. So therefore, if you damage this area, you will knock out the whole center that governs praxis. So if you damage the premotor cortex, then you'll have contralateral limb apraxia. So you'll actually have a little bit of difficulty with a contralateral arm or hand doing skilled movements. But you'll still be able to interpret the skilled movements of others. So you'll still have, the, have that abstract knowledge of which makes a good tool a good tool. And therefore, you'll be able to correctly identify that the tin can subserve as a better hammer than something like a banana. But you will still be, struggle to use that tool for that specific task of hammering. So finally, if you have a lesion in the corpus callosum, you can end up with a clumsy left hand. And if we look at this picture, we can see that we still have that intact skilled knowledge on how to execute the movement, which is, which is situated here in the left hemisphere. But it still needs to cross over to that right premotor cortex in order to tell that left hand what to do. But if you damage the corpus callosum, the information cannot cross over, and then you get what is called a clumsy left hand. So these are practices that you develop in the hand is sometimes referred to as alien hand syndrome. The person wants the hand to perform a certain task, but it sort of feels to the patient as if the hand has a mind of its own. Okay, so alien hand syndrome describes complex goal-directed activity in one hand that is not voluntarily initiated. So as we can see, there are actually three variants of alien hand syndrome. Here, I'm only going to discuss the cool version of alien hand syndrome otherwise known as the frontal variant. I'm not going to do, we, not, we won't test you on this. This is only for extra information. Okay, so the cool alien hand is that Oliver Sacks kind of material, which is a disconnection syndrome arising from a lesion in the prefrontal cortex. So again, here you have that left hemisphere in which recites abstract representation of skilled movements and knowledge of control. But the center has been disconnected from the premotor control center marked by the red cross. So the parietal lobe knows there is a hand, but it does not have any control over it. Therefore, these patients can get bizarre behavior, usually of the dominant hand. These patients experience deeper depersonalization of that erratic hand.
where it assumes a distinctly different personality. The patient may complain that the hand doesn't want to stop or that they can, can't make it listen to them. Auto criticism is not unusual. Patients may even criticize or even slap that alien hand with, a good, with their good hand as a disinhibited groping occurs. These patients might even have involuntary tendency to cause sexual fondling that may publicly embarrass the patient. An associated finding in these patients obviously sometimes include a transcortical motor aphasia. So the next type of apraxia that I'm going to talk about is ideational apraxia. It is a condition in which an individual is unable to perform a sequence of actions. In other words, the idea to perform a complex motor task is lost. Therefore, it results in the inability to select and carry out appropriate motor programs. So this is almost like the bigger blueprint that, cons that consists so to, to carry through a learned motor behavior. So idea motor apraxia that we just discussed are the smaller, the smaller blueprints, but the greater scheme of blueprints would form the ideational, the ideational for uh, apraxia. So in other words, the idea behind learned motor behavior. So for example, a patient may complete actions in incorrect orders, such as buttering bread before putting it on in the toaster or putting on shoes before putting on the socks. This commonly is tested by asking the person to prepare and mail an envelope or light a match, where the three sub goals are assessed like holding the match, holding the match box, and holding a light to match uh, to light the match. The major ideas of, uh, of where idea, um, idea, ideational apraxia is found are in the left posterior temporal parietal junction specifically the submarginal gyrus, which is located in the parietal part of the brain. So with that, it brings us to the end of our presentation. So it's been a lot of information that you had to take in, but the important thing is here is to remember that you have to stick to the ba basics, that bigger picture. Think about the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere, the dominant and non-dominant. Think about disorders that governs language and praxis. On the non-dominant side, we get disorders that governs prosody, spatial representation, as well as attention. And then when you think about anterior and posterior, we think about the central sulcus anterior to that, we're going to get output or action. And then posterior to it, we're going to get disorders that governs input or perception. And then last but not least, we're going to split up into the dorsal and ventral pathways. The dorsal representing the where pathway in our visual spatial environment, and the ventral pathway governing the what pathway, so, which, form, which forms the basis of our visual agnosias.